For our June 2020 season, we had planned to open with an exhibit of digital prints by Peter Kemble. Pandemic closures drove us forward through a full year to this virtual gathering for our friend and fellow artist. In the video, we have merged examples of his work with comments and messages offered by his friends and colleagues. In 2009, after Peter retired, I mentioned that the greeting cards which he had created and sent to friends for many years might be the start of a series of digital prints. He said he would ponder, and a few months later, voila, the print project began to show up in my mailbox, and images just kept happening. My name is John Henry. I met Peter in 1957, soon after arriving at Trinity College in Hartford to begin our freshman year. When we met, he was poring over a magazine article about Mies van der Rohe's just completed trailblazing Seagram's building in New York. Being interested in architecture myself, I was immediately drawn to Peter, who never ceased being a stimulating companion. I wound up rooming with him for two years and got to know and like him ever better. At college, Peter was something of a loner, which may be hard to believe for those who met him later, when he was a gifted conversationalist presiding over sparkling dinner parties. He really seemed to come into his own during his years as a student at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. More than once in recent years, I heard him say, at Harvard, you learn to talk. While Peter kept a low profile at Trinity, he displayed a talent for polished writing in the college newspaper that would serve him well throughout his professional career. Rereading some of his articles in that newspaper a few years ago, I, a journalist myself, felt they reflected a level of maturity more in keeping with a seasoned professional than an 18 or 19 year old. Following a fruitful career, Peter moved to Greenfield, Massachusetts to focus on his own work. He combined his love of design and architecture with lively creativity and was recognized in shows, including at the Von Auersberg Gallery at Deerfield Academy in Massachusetts in 2017, the A3 Gallery in Amherst, Massachusetts, and at the Turtle Gallery in Deer Isle, Maine.
My name is Amanda Means. Peter and I met about eight years ago. I see the playful side of Peter's personality in his work a lot, the good-natured, tongue-in-cheek side. He was having fun making his images. He had so much training and experience with designing and drawing on the computer that he could do anything he wanted and could also invent and experiment freely. He was very fluid with it. There are aspects of some of his images that make me think of Calder. In Whitson, for example, there's a wonderful whimsy and playfulness. To me, the way Peter worked with color and line relates to the way Calder might have put a mobile together. Those delicate little lines in Whitson remind me of the slender wires of a Calder mobile. Peter was such a clear and rational thinker, very, very specific. He loved focusing in on the details of life, the specifics of cooking, for example, and of language, the use of speech and words, and visually the subtle nuances of line, color, shape, and space, and all of their shifting and dynamic interactions within his artworks. On another note, I read recently that in England and Northern Ireland, Whitson was historically the name for the first holiday of summer. I imagine that's the reason Peter used that luscious, glowing, orangish yellow in his Whitson. Perhaps Peter's playfulness in this piece signifies the end of winter and the beginning of the more relaxed, easy, and playful warm days of summer. Not all of Peter's work is playful and lighthearted, though. Some works, like What Does a Brick?, are absolutely serious and profoundly moving, relating to me to some elements of a Rothko painting, broad strokes of rich, deep color, evoking profound feeling, thoughtfulness, and also urgency. Offcuts feels even more somber and contemplative on a still deeper level. I find Bumbershoot wonderfully intriguing. To me, It is a man with a very strange eye that looks like a window and a head that becomes his whole body with a puzzling red ball pendulum dangling from his chin. I love this image especially. It's very funny and shows so much of Peter's whimsical side. I can see him sitting at his desk, working on it, chuckling quietly to himself, sipping on a very good glass of wine, probably very late at night. When looking up Bumbershoot, I learned that it's a British word for umbrella. That sounds like a word Peter would know. Peter never forgot the viewer. I first saw Pushcart of Desire, 2015, at the Turtle Gallery, where it was hanging on a narrow wall below and in conversation with Proboscis with Pink Hanky, 2014. Peter liked hanging his prints in conversation where they could share ideas and visual elements. Peter knew many things, both common and arcane, so his title was not an accident. If we do the literary exercises of compare and contrast, the disparities and similarities between William's play and Peter's print are telling. A streetcar is far from a pushcart, which is more likely pushed by a poor peddler on the streets of New York City's Lower East Side. The viewer knows immediately not to expect the emotional force or grandeur or sexual passion of streetcar. Peter's joking. The desires here are humble. Two scoops of blueberry ice cream, not even coffee ice cream, which was Peter's own lifelong passion. And while William's play caricatures the upper-class longings of Blanche Dubois, Peter mocks the pushcart peddler's idealization of upper-class life. Elegance is beyond the peddler's imagination.
The main elements of the print, waiting for Lee C, are a gray, black, and white stippled square centered in a generous white border with a bold black Chinese calligraphy style character at the center that extends just beyond the square. Then there's a black character fragment lower right with an orange red stroke below fading into the white surround. Three fine orange lines and three subtle pastel color blocks play off the border and balance each other. The stippled square acts as a foil and the relationship of each of the other elements to it and to each other creates the illusion of three-dimensionality characteristic of so many of Peter's images. The print appeals for its strong graphics and overall composition. It also delights because of its whimsy. Looked at one way, the graphic curve of the character faces out. Keep looking and the curve faces in. Waiting for Li Si. Looking this way and that way. Pacing this way and that way. It's brilliant and playful. Calligraphy deconstructed. But there's more. Writing about the print made us curious, so we searched online for Li Si and calligraphy, and up popped a video of someone demonstrating Li Si Chinese calligraphy practice. The person, a woman, occasionally speaks softly, but all you see for 15 minutes is a moving handheld brush and characters emerging one after another on white parchment. The viewer waits to see the calligrapher, but she never appears. At first we thought that person must be the awaited Li Si, but it turns out that Li Si was a Chinese philosopher, politician, and writer of the Qin Dynasty, who was prime minister between 246 and 208 BC. So what exactly did Peter have in mind with the title? Did he ever see that video? Did he know that Lisi is credited with creating and standardizing calligraphy as a uniform script? Are the elements of the print, therefore, calligraphy waiting to be constructed? We wish she were here to ask, but knowing Peter, he did see that video and he did know all about Lee C., and he'd be chuckling to learn that we're just now catching on. Through his lifelong interest in art, architecture, and design, he developed an insightful humor, unique graphic talent. He used color, form, transparency in drawings and prints, which play, surprise, and mystify. Kemble died on June 15, 2019 in Greenfield, Massachusetts, at age 80.